Hello, everybody. I'm going to go over the Electoral College. It's a very sort of unique and bizarre system that the United States has uh, to choose the president and the vice president. So without further ado, let's get started. So why did the framers of the Constitution set up the Electoral College? Good question. Well, one, it was mainly the result of a compromise at the Constitutional Convention. Uh, there were some delegates who thought that the president should be chosen by Congress. Others thought that the president should be chosen by a direct vote of the people. Um, ultimately, they decided to go then with, some, with this compromise, which is sort of essentially the people choose electors and then the electors choose the president. Now we call it the electoral college. The words electoral college don't really appear in the constitution, but they did set up an electoral system and that's the term we'll use to refer to this system. <clears throat> so they ultimately decided not to have Congress choose the president because they felt like this would weaken the presidency. They wanted the president to be to serve as a legitimate check on the legislature. Remember, they thought the legislature would be naturally the most powerful branch in any representative system. So they thought, well, let's we won't we don't want the president to be a pawn or just you know a loyalist to Congress and then just do everything they want. We want the president to actually be independent, right? But why not the people? Well, um, ultimately, a lot of the framers and founder, founding fathers didn't trust the people to make uh, to make this choice, um, and so you know they thought, especially like rural voters who weren't as well educated you know, that they wouldn't be able to, they could be easily swayed and maybe pick a, a bad leader. Um, also, the Southern states didn't want direct popular vote. Many of the Southern states didn't want that because they felt like that would greatly diminish their power since much of their population consisted of slaves and slaves wouldn't, you know, at that time have been allowed to vote. So um, so that was another reason. So, so there are several reasons, but mainly it was a compromise and they just kind of made it up at the convention. So how was it intended to work? So like, how did they think this would, would play out? Well, they kind of thought, well, these would be wise. The electors would be these wise individuals, you know, who each state would choose the way they are selected, right? So today it's done by vote of the people in those states. But so it was up to the states to decide, but that they thought whoever was chosen through whatever method they would end up being, you know, well-respected citizens and they would be the elites. In other words, they would be people like themselves, like the founders, and they, they would be able to make a much wiser or, you know, a, a much better choice of who would make a good president. And the original thought was, so each, each uh, elector was given two votes, right? Two ballots, um, and they would basically cast their two electoral votes, basically their first choice and their second choice, um, regardless of political party. Remember, they weren't factoring political parties into this. So that that quickly changes with the with the formation of, of the party system. So but um, anyway, so basically the, the, the person who got the most votes, as long as it was a majority of the overall votes would be president, whoever finished second would be the vice president. That's how they intended it to work. Right. And that quickly gets messed up in 1800 when Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr tie uh, and they're both Democratic Republicans from that party. Anyway, so they end up passing the 12th Amendment, which now says electors get two votes, but one of them goes to who they want to be president and a separate ballot is cast for who they want to be vice president. So that's how it works now. <clears throat> and they thought oftentimes, you know, that the vote would be so split between different candidates that the um you know that the congress would end up choosing the president anyway the house would choose the president and the senate would choose the vice president and they would pick amongst the top three finishers so they thought well for those who wanted congress to choose the president the electors would sort of narrow it down uh and then the congress would choose but this this hasn't happened very often because of the party system we usually have an outright winner right because the electoral vote is only split between two candidates usually. Not, you know, sometimes you have a third party candidate who, who gets a few electoral votes, but usually that's not the case. So 
not since 1824 has the House had to vote on the president. And that was that was when John Quincy Adams was elected. So is this how the Electoral College still works today? Does it work how the founders originally intended it? And my answer uh, from uh, John Bender from Breakfast Club, not even close, bud. Okay, so it's not, it does not work the way that they intended it. So some people who defend the Electoral College and say, well, this is what the founders intended. And they didn't trust the people to make the choice. That's not how it works anymore. So that is an irrelevant argument. So what we want to mainly focus on then, um, you know, since this is a government class, not history, but, you know, you got a little bit of the background, but let's, let's look at then how the Electoral College works today. Okay, so I'll do this through sort of a series of questions and answers. Um, the first question then is, how many electoral votes does each state receive? So again, you're trying to win the electoral vote to win the presidency. That's what really matters. So how do we know how many votes each state receives? It is not based on population. You can't say population determines electoral votes. That's partially true, but that is far from the actual truth. Population influences the electoral vote, but electoral votes are decided by how many members you have in Congress from your state. So how many representatives you have and Congress member is the House and the Senate. Yes, the House members are roughly based on a state's population, but senators are not, right? Senate seats are allocated by you know, two per state regardless of population. So that skews the results and that's largely why you can't say it's population based. And so in Georgia, um, for instance, we have 14 House members and two senators. Therefore, we receive 16 electoral votes. What this literally means is Georgia in the 2020 election, in 2016, 2012, only 16 Georgians actually voted for president. Yes, only 16 people in Georgia actually got to cast a vote for president and vice president. And Washington, D.C., based on the 23rd Amendment, gets three electoral votes regardless. They get the same as the smallest state. So this was the electoral map in 2012. So it does change after, you know, every 10 years when we do a census, they reallocate, you know, they do reapportionment and they reallocate the House seats across the country. Since Congress has capped the House at 435, that means that's 435 electoral votes to be distributed, plus the three that automatically go to DC. And then uh, you also have the Senate votes, right? Now, House and Senate members are not electors, nor are they allowed to be. They cannot be electors, but that's just how we get the numbers, okay? So Senate being 100, so that means there's 538 electoral votes up for grabs each election. Okay, but you can see how they're distributed amongst the states. Again, as an amateur looking at this, you might say, well, gosh, who really benefits? Who has an advantage? And you'd say, well, California, they have 55 votes. That's great for them. 38 for Texas. Wow, that's great for them. No, that is absolutely not true. In fact, Texas, California, those states get the worst deal in this system. And we'll see, how, see why that's true later. But you can also see maybe little numbers in the corner of some of the states like Georgia says plus one, Texas says plus four, New York says minus two, Ohio minus two. That means they lost or gained that number of electoral votes between the 2010 census and the two, well, from the 20, 2000 census to the 2010 census. So after the 2010 census, the, some states gained electoral votes, some states lost because the number is right now fixed at 538. If anyone gains a seat, someone else has to lose one. So how many electoral votes do you need to win the election? Well, we said there's 538. Well, you need a majority to win. So you do the math, 538 divided by two is 269. That's half, you need a majority. 50% is not a majority. So you need 270 electoral votes to win. Right, that's the bare minimum. George Bush, for example, in the 2000 election, he won 271 electoral votes, right? So just barely won that election with the majority over Al Gore. Although Al Gore won the popular vote that year, much like in 2016 when Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, but Donald Trump won the electoral vote. 
Now, states, most 48 of the 50 states and Washington, D.C., use what's called a winner-take-all system of distributing electoral votes. Remember, not only, do, not only do states determine the voting qualifications for their state, they also determine how the electoral votes will be distributed. So, <clears throat> so only Nebraska and Maine use a different system, which we'll look at in a few minutes. But let's look at what we mean by winner take all. So in Georgia, as an example, in 2016, the winner take all system is in effect. So therefore, that means whoever wins the popular vote in a state, whoever gets the most popular votes, it doesn't even have to be a majority. It can be a plurality. In this case, case Donald Trump did win a slight majority of Georgia's popular vote in 2016. Donald Trump and Mike Pence, therefore, since they got 50.4% of the popular vote in Georgia, they got all of Georgia's electoral votes. Winner take all. Winner of the popular vote takes all of the electoral votes. This is the first of many sort of bizarre or you could say flawed mechanisms of the Electoral College that you could barely eke out a victory and you it's, it's as if you won 100% of the vote. Um, you know, again, it could even be Trump won 40% and Clinton won 39% and Gary Johnson won, you know, 10% or whatever, and it would still be 100% of the votes to the top finisher, which would be Donald Trump. Um, anyway, you can see somehow how the votes broke down in Georgia. So it's relatively close, but those 45% of Georgians who voted for Clinton get nothing in terms of, you know, votes for president. And so who... Who are these? Remember, I said there's 16 Georgians. Well, what happens is the Republicans had 16 people pre-selected to vote for Donald Trump. Hillary Clinton and Tim Kaine had a different group of 16 Georgians pre-selected who would have voted for Hillary Clinton had they won the votes, the more most votes. Uh, Gary Johnson had another group of 16 Georgians and so forth. So it's really when you vote for president, you're not voting for president, you're voting for the electors for that candidate, right? So it's a, it's like they're the middleman. You vote for the electors. We do that on the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. Then on the first Monday after the second Wednesday of December, the electors actually cast their official vote. And so this in Georgia, those 16 Georgians who were pledged to vote for Donald Trump were the ones elected and they all did vote for Donald Trump and Mike Pence. So again, it's not what the founders intended. These people are simply party loyalists. They're not wise, you know, individuals who are, who are sort of independent minded and picking the best person. These are complete party loyalists. And although we'll talk about how there were actually seven electors who didn't nationwide in 2016, who didn't vote for the candidate they pledged to vote for, that almost never happens ever, 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 but it did happen. To, there were seven in 2016, but that was a bizarre election. <clears throat> so within the Electoral College, in fact, I think they used this map uh, or a very similar one on the AP exam a few years ago for one of the FRQs. And so what you have is a few states that play a really important role in the election. We call these swing states or battleground states. And although these states can change from year to year, from decade to decade, you know, Ohio and Florida have for a long time throughout my life have been really important swing states. OK, um, you know, just because they have there happen to be states, all that means is they could those states can vote for Republican or Democratic candidates. They kind of swing back and forth depending on the election. Um, now, Virginia was not a swing state until very recently. Uh, but Georgia is becoming, you know, pretty much of what we call, see, another term you hear is red states, blue states, right? Red states are solid Republican states. Blue states are solid Democratic states. Uh, the purple states are the ones that can swing either way. Um, so, yeah, you, California has the most electoral votes, but neither party really has spent a lot of time campaigning in California recently, in recent elections, because California is a solid blue state. So the Democrat knows they don't have to really worry about it. And not, the Republican knows they have no chance. Likewise, you know, Texas, the second biggest prize, has been a red state for a long time. Now, Texas is becoming more purple. You know, 
it's 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 seen as becoming maybe a swing state maybe in 2020 but definitely in the future um anyway so but you can see right now wisconsin ohio colorado virginia florida you know throw in a few other states like i said maybe georgia north carolina um arizona so th so there are some other swing states this one highlights just a few of them but really it comes down to maybe 10 12 states where candidates spend the vast majority of their time campaigning because the rest of the states are seen as safe either red or blue all right, so I said two states use a different method, Nebraska and Maine, and this is just up to the state legislatures. Any states could do this if they wanted to, but you know what they do in Nebraska and Maine is you, they set up uh, each electoral vote is separated by congressional district, House district. So Nebraska has three House districts and two senators, therefore they have five electoral votes. Well, in 2008, if you look at the different districts here, Remember, districts are based on population, so that the size of the districts varies as long as the population is equal, right? One man, one vote, one person, one vote. So the first district voted, the people in that district voted more for John McCain in 2008. So that was one electoral vote for McCain. In District 2, Obama got more votes from the people in that district. So Obama won one electoral vote there. And then in District 3, McCain got more votes, so that's a second vote for McCain. McCain won the statewide vote, so he gets the bonus two votes that represent the two senators. So in 2008, uh, McCain won four votes from Nebraska, four electors, and then there was one elector for, for Obama. So it's kind of an interesting way of doing it. It's a little more fair than winner take all, but it's still not completely you know, equitable. Um, because again, you could barely win, you know, a district and that skews the results versus you could win it by a lot, whatever, you still only get the one vote, All right? So, and May, like I said, Maine does that. So in 2016, um, uh, Trump won one of Maine's electoral votes and Hillary Clinton won three, I believe. All right, the next question then, what happens if nobody gets to 270? Remember I said this is what the founders or framers of the Constitution thought would happen fairly often. So what happens if nobody gets to 270? So if the, the highest finisher ends up with, say, 260 or 250, you know, maybe there's a couple third-party candidates who, who win some votes, or the two-party candidates, the two big parties, the two main parties might ex you know just tie each, each candidate getting 269. Remember, if that happens, the House chooses the president from the top three finishers with the most electoral votes. And each state would get one vote. OK, so that would be kind of crazy for a couple of reasons. One, because when they made this rule, there were 13 states. So you'd always have an eventual winner. Now we have 50 states. So you could have a 25-25 tie. Um, and the other problem is, what if your state has, say, two members in the House or four members, some even number like that? And maybe they're two Republicans, two Democrats, right? Well, you could have a problem there um, because, or Maine who has one, you know, say they had one Republican, one Democrat. How do they choose who to vote for, right? In Georgia, it would be easier because you have, you know, 10, um, let's say, I think, let's see right now, 10, uh, I think 10 Republicans, four Democrats or nine, five, I think something like that. but. I think it's nine five but yeah so the republicans would outvote the democrats and cast their vote for the republican now one thing i forgot to mention you know with the with the uh, why don't more states do what maine and nebraska does well the the answer is because it you know remember the state legislatures set their voting rules for how they distribute electoral votes why would georgia's republican legislature want to change it because if they changed it which party would it help right you know in recent elections it would have helped the democrats because Instead of you know 16 to zero you know electoral vote for Trump, it would have been like 10 to four. Uh, well, no, sorry, it would have been like um, 12 to four or 11 to five, something like that, which you know would have just given Hillary Clinton more votes. Likewise, in a blue state like California, Trump would have won some of the California House districts. Therefore, he would have taken at least some votes from California. So most states, I think, don't change it because it would hurt their party. Now, you can see here, anyway, that this hasn't happened since 1824 in terms of nobody getting a majority. 
All right, so which states benefit from the Electoral College? Again, you might think, oh, California, Texas, they, they have it great, you know. That's not the case. And if you look at the population numbers versus electoral vote numbers, you see that that's true. Wyoming, the smallest state in the country, in 2017, they had about 579,000 people. We have more people in Cobb County than they have in the whole state of Wyoming. Yet uh, Wyoming gets three electoral votes. Montana, you see, gets also gets three. But look, Montana has not quite, but like close to double the population of Wyoming, and they still only get three electoral votes. So it's it's just it's skewed the way these are distributed, right? Um, Georgia has 16 electoral votes, but we have over, over 10 million people. Uh, I think now we're close to around 11 million. And you look at states like Texas, California, it looks like they, they get off really well. You know, they have a good deal. But look at how many voters there are per electoral vote that they receive. So California has 718,000 people for every electoral vote they get for president, right? So if you compare Texas and Wyoming in this graph, a one voter in Wyoming's vote for president is weighted 3.85 times more than one person's vote in Texas. And to me, this is just the ultimate unfair, you know, part of the system, because why should you get more say in who the president is just because you live in a state with fewer people, right? My argument is, okay, you live in a state where no one wants to live like Alaska because it's really cold. Therefore, you should get more voice in choosing the president. To me, that makes no sense, okay? It's a national, it's the only office along with vice president that's national. So why don't we have it a national vote, you know? It's a crazy idea, right? Everyone votes, everyone's vote counts exactly as one, right? Every vote account would be weighted exactly one. And in the end, once you count up all the votes, Whoever gets the most votes wins. It's crazy, I know, but that's just, you know, kind of makes sense to me. We'll come back to that. So again, this, this is a little bit older, this graphic, but from a few years ago, but it gives you an idea uh, based on the size, you know, states are resized based on how much people's votes are counted uh, per, uh, you know, per each person's votes are counted per electoral vote, right? So um and so you can see this what the ones that really get enlarged like vermont and wyoming and uh dc and stuff and then you see states that are really tiny like california and texas relative to their size they don't get as many electoral votes so my picture is blocking and i think but the popular vote then does it even matter and the question sort of yes and no if you what you can't see in the part is hillary hillary clinton got 65 million seven hundred eighty eight thousand five hundred eighty three votes uh you can't see trump's but it's 62 million nine hundred fifty five thousand three hundred sixty three so basically hillary clinton got about 2.8 million more votes across the country and she lost right so again to me does that make a lot of sense not really. I don't, I don't think it makes any sense. But um, but it does. The popular vote matters. But what it matters, where it matters is in within each state. OK, um, so it's basically 51 different elections because you throw in Washington, D.C. That it's 51 separate elections. And to win the presidency, you just have to cobble together the different puzzle pieces. You have to you know, win the right combination of states, right? If you win Georgia, boom, you get 16. If you win California, boom, another 55. You keep having, you have to keep winning states until you get to that magic number of 270, right? And then you just hope none of your electors betray you or or leave you and not end up not voting for you. But um, but there have been, besides Donald Trump, there were, you know, it's, there's been a total of five presidents, so four others who've won the election, even though they lost the national popular vote. So it ma the national popular vote doesn't really matter, but the state by state vote does matter quite a bit. So what are some of the criticisms of the Electoral College? Um, first, you know, that it's, I've mentioned it's undemocratic, that you can receive fewer votes, you can finish second, and you could win the presidency. Um, to me, that just doesn't make a lot of sense, right? What other 
in what other contests does the second place finisher, you know, win? You know, it, do, it doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Um, sometimes I'll use an example of like, if you had a game, if you had like a bas a football game, let's just say, and you had four quarters, um, you know, and one team ends up winning 48 to 24, but they they're declared the losers because the other team actually outscored them in three of the four quarters. That that wouldn't make sense to us, right? Um, you know. Anyway, so it's 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 very it's undemocratic. Um, like I said, another problem is voters typically in the lower populated states uh, have they see their um, votes weighted more heavily. I messed up the sentence here, but um, so they end up having their votes weighted more heavily. Um, their vote counts more. In certain states, your vote counts more than people in other states, which to me doesn't make any sense. It's not fair. I don't think you should get a benefit just because you happen to live in a state with fewer people. Uh, the other, another criticism, criticism is that electors can change their votes. So again, this doesn't happen very often, but you know, if, if the electors can change their votes, well, in fact, that's what the founders wanted, right? Their, their idea was that if the people were clamoring for some candidate who wasn't qualified, that the electors would actually just vote for who they thought was best, regardless of what the people wanted. But in, by today's calculation, a lot of people think, oh, the electors should just vote how they said they would vote, right? So in 2016, seven electors changed their votes, five from Clinton changed to other people and two from Trump. Um, so several votes were cast for a former, former general named Colin Powell. Uh, Bernie Sanders got a vote, um, a Native American, uh, uh, pro, uh, what's his um, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but um, anyway, you had uh, John Kasich, the governor at the time of Ohio, got a vote. So anyway, several electors were the, what we'd call faithless electors. They didn't stick with the candidate they had said they would vote for. And the other problem is if no candidate wins a majority, Congress chooses the president, which is not only um, would become very unbalanced because you'd have the really small states would get one vote and the really heavily populated states would also get one vote. But again, it would be undemocratic because would, the, hand, the choice would totally be out of the hands of the people. So whether you like the Electoral College or not, you can probably tell where I stand on it. I think it's a really just outdated, unnecessary system that should go away, but it's likely here to stay whether we like it or not. Why? Well, one, it would take a constitutional amendment to get rid of it. And as we know, it's very hard to pass a constitutional amendment. Most constitutional amendments have been passed by getting a vote of two thirds of the House, two thirds of the Senate, and three-fourths of the state legislatures, which leads us to our next problem or, or, or reason why it's probably not going to go away, is that many states benefit from this system, and so they don't want to get rid of it, right? So this could be both states that are sort of the smaller states who, get, who have their uh, votes weighted more, but also states who are maybe the swing states who get a lot of attention during the election, and they like that because that means the candidates spend a lot of time there and they spend a lot of money there through advertising. So it's going to take a real big, you know, sort of uprising of the people, I think, to get this done. In fact, remember one, one method that hasn't ever been successfully used to amend the Constitution is that two thirds of the states could request a constitutional convention and Congress would be forced to call a convention to amend the Constitution. And then you could have maybe three fourths of states vote for it in ratifying conventions, which also is that's only happened once, right? So that could happen, but you know, it's probably not going to happen anytime soon. So anyway, hopefully that gives you a better understanding of the Electoral College and how it works, and that will help you on the AP exam. Thanks, guys. Have a good have a good day.